But you can, listen, that definition has a Bible definition. And if you get outside the Bible realm, you're in falsehood. That's right. Listen, and we're, we're gonna read down John chapter number three this morning. We're gonna read down to verse number 21. For sake of time, I'm just going to read uh, verse 36 too. We'll read 21, we'll skip to 36. And hopefully I can, uh, I'm going to preach 1 through 21 there. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a, a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Uh, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter to the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I say unto thee, you must be born again. What I don't want to do, what I don't want to do, is I don't want you to mistake in what he's saying here. This, the passage has nothing to do with water baptism. He's talking about a physical birth, a water birth from your mother. We say her water broke. And then he's talking about a spiritual birth. He must be born again. Okay? Let's look at this. Verse number 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knoweth not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. And if I told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven, Notice the illustration, as Mo, and as Moses is lifted up, as uh, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, uh, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have uh, eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Listen, my brethren, I want you to see this. He gives us the illustration in this passage. But then he also gives us a warning very serious warning in this passage. Here's what we're not saying this morning. We are not saying that sin does not have an appeal to your flesh. We are not saying that there's not a pleasure in sin. There, we're not saying that there's not some appeal to you that you get excitement out of. Listen, anybody here who's committed sin did not commit sin because they hated it. They did it because you enjoyed it. The Bible says men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. We are not saying there's not a pleasure associated with it. We're going to lay that foundation first. What, are we, what we're saying is this. Ye must, not maybe, not should, ye must. 
be born again. You're not going to heaven if you don't receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. But what we're not saying is that there's a, there's a deception. There's a deception in a lot of churches. And a lot of churches like to say, oh, well, man, that's, a, that's, a, that's just, uh, it's really not enjoyable. Sin is dirty and nasty. No, to your flesh, it's really enjoyable. You like it. And what it usually is is a perversion of things that God really has given you to enjoy. He intended for a man and wife to be together. He expected them to enjoy that relationship. But he didn't intend for a man and a man to be together. A woman and a woman to be together. Two that ain't married to be together. A dog and a human to be together. All kind of beasts. He drew those lines. But listen, we're creeping up on that in our society. Because there's a pleasure associated with sin. And let me tell you what. Your flesh will never be satisfied with sin. That's why you're seeing sin we haven't heard of in a while in this country that are in our face. Because there's a pleasure associated with sin. Sin is never satisfied. It's degrading. It has to get worse and worse and worse. And listen, let me say something. Sin is often a corruption of something that God gave us that is good. Mm. Marriage is honorable and the bed and the father. God gives you that. But he says, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. That's the corruption of sin. Amen. You have to be born again. You have, listen, God has to change your want to. He has to change. Listen, there's a pleasure that comes, and people don't even think about this, with serving God. Did you ever think about that? Listen, I don't serve God because I have to. Somebody's forcing me to. I don't serve God because somebody's putting a gun in my head. Listen, I can walk away from this anytime I want to. The problem is, I don't want to. He's changed my want to. I don't serve him because I have to. I love him. Amen. Listen, he paid my sin debt. It's, it's not a, a religious thing to me where I'm in bondage to my religion and, oh man, I'm enslaved. No, I serve it. I want to see other people get saved because of what he's done in my life. Listen, except a man be born again. Listen, you're going to have to recognize the truth is this. There is a pleasure. Look at this. Hebrews chapter number 11. Listen, just because it's enjoyable, just because your flesh likes it, doesn't mean that God is pleased with it. But God has given you a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. He's given you an outlet with most sins. And listen, he says, be not drunk with wine, where is that test? But what is what are you supposed to do instead? To be filled with the Spirit. You're supposed to be filled with the Spirit. In place of getting drunk and carrying on, you're to be filled with the Spirit. He gives you something that's good and right in the place of the old garbage that you used to think was fun. And let me ask you something. I don't know about you, but my life, my sin. At first, it seemed like it was fun. It seemed like everybody was trying to keep me, restrain me from the things that I enjoyed. Oh, well, you know, it's, and the people want to know this in church. Is it fun? Is it fun? Is, it, is your church fun? <laughs> I've heard that a lot. Listen, y'all. God help us. God help us. We have turned this thing to lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And when we come to church, listen, listen to me. This is what I tell people. If you're saved and you love God, our church is fun. Amen. Amen. If you're looking for something other than that, our church is not fun. Funny doing it. That's what they call it. Amen. Listen, there is a, a, a pleasure associated with sin. I want to expose you. The Bible does it openly admits that sin has a pleasure associated with it. But it also tells you that you better get the fix for that and you better get that thing right or you're going to perish. Listen, we want to quote the verse. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes him shall not perish. To have everlasting life. Good. Believe uh, on Lord Jesus Christ. Now shall be saved. Listen, the belief part and the, and the eternal life part. But did you realize there's a perish part in there too? Did you ignore that part? God is not willing that any should perish, 
He's long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Did you forget that part? Look at this Hebrews 11, verse number 25. It says, By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called uh, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the what? Pleasure. Pleasures of sin for a season. There, your flesh is pleased with sin. It likes sin. There's a, 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 a sensual, a, a, a fleshly satisfaction that comes with sin. But what I'm telling you is what the sin like, uh, what the flesh likes is what will condemn you. Listen, I'm not saying you quit all your sin. Listen, you don't get saved by quitting your sin. That ain't how people get saved. I, I can quit. I Listen, I'm in favor of repentance. I like repentance. I think a person should repent. Except you repent, you shall likewise perish. But listen, if I'm walking this way and I quit doing stuff and I turn and I don't accept what is there in front of me as the gift and forgiveness of my sin, I'm still lost. I don't care what I turn from. That's right. Right? But I believe, listen, you're going to have to get to a point where you realize your sin is the problem. Your sin is what's condemning you, and I don't believe it's just the sin of unbelief. I believe it is a sin that condemns you. Now, the one sin that you better overcome is your sin of unbelief because you have to put your faith in what Christ did for you or you're going to hell. That's right. But there's a lot of sins. There's a lot of sins that can entangle you. A lot. Look what it says. There's a pleasure of sin. Titus chapter 3. Titus 3. Titus chapter 3, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey master, magistrates, to be ready to every uh, good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness to all men. We ourselves were sometimes foolish and disobedient and deceived and serving divers of lust and what? Pleasures. Pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another, but after this, a kindness. And love of God our Savior toward men appeared not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy that he, uh, uh, he saved us by the washing of re regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Let me say something to you. There's a pleasure associated with sin. The Bible doesn't hide that. In your past, you listen. And notice, notice the pleasure is in the same context of, now think about this. You would never think this. Think about it. It says, serving divers, lust, and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. In the same context, pleasure, that pleasure of sin and those lusts are in the same context of malice, hated, and hating one another. Isn't that something? Yes. There is pleasure that God intended within boundaries, and he's okay with it. You get out of bounds, he's no longer okay with it. Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. So I'm going to lay the groundwork. People might make an excuse. Well, I just enjoy it. I don't think God would keep me from anything. I enjoy it. And, 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 and I just feel good about it. Okay? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our, uh, Lord, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the gathering of together unto him that you uh, be not soon shaken in mind and, or troubled or, either by spirit or by word nor by letter from us as the day of Christ is at hand let no man deceive you by any means for that day uh, shall not come except there be a uh, there come a falling away first and that, that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, uh, that he might be revealed in, in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wick, uh, that wicked be revealed. 
uh, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying waters, talked about that in Sunday school, with all the uh, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because, look, they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Look, look, uh, that they might be damned who believe not the truth. Look, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The word of God condemns pleasure in unrighteousness. Okay? It may seem fun. It may seem enjoyable to your flesh. I'm telling you, if it's against God, he condemns it, and you need to be born again. You must be, the scripture says, in fact. 1 Timothy chapter 5, 1 Timothy 5. I'm just going to lay the groundwork here. Because, listen, the scriptures does say that there's a pleasure associated with it, but that does not mean it's right. What I find is when you first start out, when I first started out drinking and doing things I shouldn't have been doing, it seemed really fun. It seemed really enjoyable. What I didn't see is it was bait on a hook. It was bait on a trap. There was a net being spread for me. That's what I didn't see. See, I always told my Sunday school class this, maturity is being able to look beyond the point of pleasure. You have to look down the road. Spiritual maturity is the same way. you got to ask yourself some questions. Now listen to me. You're, you're confronted with it. Any of you got internet in your home? Anybody go on the internet for anything? I'm telling you, listen to me, guys and girls. You're going to be presented with things that you know you shouldn't be putting your eyes on, and you're going to have to make a conscious choice whether to put your eyes on that or not. And this generation will flood you. You can't buy a tool without seeing a naked woman, naked man. You can't go into Walmart without seeing some ungodliness everywhere you turn. That's right. And you better make a conscious decision. You better make a conscious decision that you're going to be careful. Little eyes where you go, what you see. Careful little ears what you hear. Careful little feet where you go. You better be careful. Surfing on that internet. You better be careful where you surf. There's some sharks in some water, and they're, they're waiting. They smell the blood in the water. They're waiting on you. I'm telling you, the Bible says her feet, uh, uh, her steps lead down to hell. You better be careful. I'm telling you, this generation is flooding us. Why are they flooding us the way they're flooding us? They recognize that there's a pleasure associated with sin. And they also recognize this. They can get you to cross one line. Did you notice the line that's mentioned all the time in the scriptures? You see it over and over. What line is that? Fornication. You see a line that it seems to be, I'm not saying it is, because there's some others that are high. One of the things he wants, if, 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 listen, a nation tried to get Israel to fall, you know how they got them to fall? Fornication. And it led to what? Idolatry. Every time. Let me tell you what, the two are married together. Listen, all these idols in Hollywood, listen, their fornication is married to the idolatry they want you to follow. I'm telling you, listen, you better be wary of what, listen, it may seem fun at the time, but when that trap comes down and you're caught in it, that's where I was at when the Lord found me. I'm glad he sets the captive free because I was in bondage when he caught me. When he found me, I was in bondage. Right. And I'm glad he's able to get you out. But I'm going to tell you what. I got many a scar because I didn't listen and I was hard hit. You might get out and he might save you. He might forgive you. But you're going to carry those scars till you leave here. We're going to carry them. You better be careful. We try to warn you. And listen, a lot of people will not listen to what I'm saying. I did not listen to a godly father who loved me enough to tell me the truth about it. And listen, I wished a thousand times over I would have took his advice. I can't go back and change it. Only thing I can do is live with the scars and warn other people not to go where I went. 
1 Timothy chapter 5. Look what's said to the widow here. 1 Timothy 5. Look at verse number 3. Honor widows that, widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them uh, learn first to show piety at home to requite their parents. For that is good and acceptable before God. Now she, uh, she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. Look, look, look at the warning is given to this, this widow. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. She doesn't have liberty to go around sleeping around or any of that kind of stuff. She doesn't have liberty to do what she wants. She has to do what God wants. In fact, the ones that can remarry, it says that they can marry who they will. And it gives them a charge only in the Lord. So he's cautioning them. Don't you go and marry some lost man. Don't you go and marry somebody who's going to hinder you from doing what you need to do for the Lord if you're a widow. Mm. So he's saying, look, he's cautioning even that. Remember Samson? Remember Samson, what he said in Judges 14? He sees this Philistine woman, the arch enemies of Israel. You know what he told his father? Get her, for she pleaseth me well. Oh, yeah, Samson, how does she please you? She a godly woman? No. She loves the Lord? She loves the same God as you? She's willing to give up her idols? How does she please you, Samson? Oh, I see. Listen, this is an age-old issue. Let me say something to you. Just because it feels good this, this world has a saying, and it's been around since the 60s, I believe. I believe that's where it started. If it feels good, do it. You better not. There's some things that might feel good at the time that you're going to pay for the rest of your life. It might feel good, you might do it, but you might wind up with some sexually transmitted disease that you've got to live with the rest of your life. Mm. Did it feel that good? Think about it. Think about it. There is too few people who stop and think beyond the point of pleasure. Just because it feels good does not mean it's wise to do. Yeah, but don't fill up the bathtub. Put your head on it. <laughs> then there's bucket. Amen. Thank God for it. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm just going to lay this foundation. And once I lay this foundation, hopefully I can lay the axe to the root of this thing. Look at uh, 2 Timothy 3. It says, This so also in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their, self, their own selves, covetous, Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, petty, high-minded, high look, look, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Listen, what we're not saying is that sin doesn't have a pleasure associated with it. We're not saying that it don't feel good. What we're saying is that you must be born again. And if you're not, the scriptures are very plain that it's fun sometimes. It's very plain that your flesh enjoys it. But it's also very plain that that's what's going to condemn you. Yep. It's also very plain that except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Turn back to John chapter 3. John 3. So let's look at this. Now that we've laid that foundation, let's look at John chapter number 3. Notice what he says in verse 3. Verse number 3, he says, Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus didn't understand. He says, Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time 
into his mother's womb and be born? I don't think that was an unreasonable question. He didn't understand. And so he's asking questions. At least he's seeking, right? One thing about Nicodemus, you see him later. You see him over there with Joseph of Arimathea, who's a believer. What's he doing associated with him? You see him later in the scriptures. I believe Nicodemus got his eyes open right here. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot uh, enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. For when I say unto thee, he must be born again. 1 John 5, 1 John 5, John, later in his life, talks about this again. Uh, an older man now and beginning to reflect back. The dates in my Bible are correct. It looks like it's about 60 years later, 50-something years later, something like that. He's an older man. Look what he says in uh, John, 1 John 5. He says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Notice the born again. Here he is, born of the Spirit. And everyone that loveth him, that begot, loveth him that is him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth? Look, believeth. So how do you get born again? John 3 uh, it says, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here it is again, uh, 1 John 5, 5. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is true. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness uh, of God which he had testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not hath made God a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God has given unto us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Now listen, this Bible is real hard to understand, people say. Real difficult, real complicated, real deep. All right. One syllable words. Look how simple it is. It ain't as hard as people make it. You know why it's hard for people? Men, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That's why it's so hard for some people because they love their sin. Look how simple it is. One syllable words in the whole verse. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. How hard is that? It's, do you have him or don't you? That's the key to being born again. Had you believed on him or had you not? Look at verse number 13. These things that are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that we may. What's the next word? Listen, I, 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 listen. I'm not, I'm not hoping, thinking, maybe, uh, please. Uh, I just fingers crossed. I don't commit another sin. And this, listen, he didn't write what he wrote so that we live in that type of fear. If it was of your righteousness, you're not going anywhere. That's right. If you don't have the righteousness of Christ, which is received by faith in what he's done for you, you ain't going. You can't sit here and tell me that you believe you're good enough to go when the Bible says that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We're all as an unclean thing. Man in his best state is altogether man. How are you going to get to heaven knowing that's the best you can do? But he wrote the things he wrote 
so that you can know. I'm not living in fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. He's not expecting us to walk around scared half to death. We are his children or we're not. When we're born again, we're either in his family or we didn't get born again. And we can't be unborn once we're born. He, he does what he does. He does perfect. The Bible says we're kept by the power of God. You're not kept by your goodness and your righteousness. You're kept by his goodness and his righteousness. And that's it. Listen, the Jews had a problem with that. Paul began to reason with them about it. He said, brother, my heart's desire, Romans 10, uh, my heart's desire prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. But I bear the record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to do what? Establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to what? The righteousness of God. Have you submitted yourself to the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ? Or are you still trusting in your righteousness? Now, brethren, let me say something to you. I am not saying you can live any way you want to live. I do not believe that garbage. I believe God corrects his own, even unto death, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I believe he chastens every son that he receives. Every son he scourges. That's what he says. Listen, it's got to be by faith. The Bible says these things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. All right, let's look at the illustration. Let's go back to John 3, and we'll close this out. John chapter number 3. God gives us illustration. A lot of times people read John 3.16 and they ignore the verses before and they ignore the verses after. What I did want to do today is ignore the verses before and ignore the verses after. It's very clear. It's very clear that Jesus is telling... I'm not against quoting John 3.16 to nobody. Okay? I'm, I'm really not. But what we need to understand is there's a context to John 3.16. And in that context, he actually gives you a real illustration. Look at uh, verse number 14. He gives you a real illustration. He says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So the illustration is, Israel has sinned. Let's turn there. Numbers chapter 21. Let's see the illustration. That, and you know, people make it more complicated than what it is. Listen, salvation is both simple and it's complex. It's complex for that one who's looking for an excuse not to believe. It's simple for that person who realizes, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner and somebody's got to help me or I'm not going to make it. That type of person is simple for them. I, I made a mess of it. I tried it my way, and it didn't work. For the person who's always got the excuse and always got the reason and always got the logic, it's complicated for them. But us that have believed, we understand it's really not all that difficult. Look at verse number uh, four. Verse number four. It says, and they journeyed from uh, Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to come past the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Isn't that something? Who told them to go that way? Who told them to go that way? You know what people get discouraged about? Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know what? Some people will get discouraged by that. But it's the way that God prepared. It is the only way. And here they are. They're discouraged by the way. It's the way that God had prepared for them. Mm. 
Verse number five, and the people spake against God and against Moses. That's what they'll do. When they don't like God's way, they, they speak against God and the preacher. It's their fault. How dare them tell me that I have to be born again? How dare him, God, tell me what to do? That's what, we will not have this man to reign over us. That's the attitude of this world. Look at this. Verse 5. Numbers 21, 5. And the people spake against uh, God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth is like bread. Isn't that something? God provides and people still complain. We don't have no bread. Oh yeah, we just have this light bread. That's just like you and me. We complain about everything God does for us. He fed you today. I mean, you, you, got, you got endless options of what you could eat. Anybody here just eat bread and water this week? And you know what we do on a regular basis? I, I'm preaching to the preacher now. We complain. And he still provides. Yes. You know what the problem is? The flesh is never satisfied. Yeah. It's never satisfied. Look at this. Verse number six. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. What a wonderful day when you get to the point where you realize you've got a problem. They're fixing to get some help here. We have sinned. They acknowledge their sin. David said in Psalm 51, I acknowledge in Psalm 32, I acknowledge my transgression before these. Look at this. We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Uh, notice the repentance that is there. Notice I've spoken. They, they, they're acknowledging that what they've done was against God. And now they're turning back to him for help. Look at this. And the Lord said in the uh, back verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpent from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. That's it. That's where we get the hymn. Look and live. Look and live, my brother live. Look to Jesus, John chapter number three and live. It's recorded in my, his word. Hallelujah. It's only that you look and live. You know how simple it is? He said, this illustration here in the wilderness, I've given, and now I'm showing you the kind of faith you've got to have in Christ. Sin has caused uh, uh, corruption in you. And that, listen, the sin, that serpent biting you is a picture of that sin. And it's in you. You know what he said? I want you to put a serpent on a pole and everybody who, you know what Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And so there he is. It's your move. He has done everything he can to convince you of who he is. And now it takes a simple faith. It's a simple faith, y'all. It's a simple faith. Look how he... The scripture says, look and live. You know what that required? Somebody to believe that what God said would happen when I look is going to happen. You know what? You're going to have to believe what God said about his son. You're going to have to believe that he'll forgive you in order to receive it. You're going to have to believe that you're a sinner. You're going to have to understand who you are and the problem you've got. But let me warn you about something. If you don't, you're going to pay. You're going to perish. Listen, I didn't say it. Right smack in the middle of the, this passage, we've gone either side of it. 
is God so loved the world. He so loved you, he made a way. He loved the children of Israel and provided a way for them to be forgiven in the wilderness and used that as an illustration of Christ. Are you going to look and live? Are you going to stay in the pleasures of your sin and you're going to die and you're going to fulfill the other half of the verse? The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son who sort of believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know what the next verse says? For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. You were condemned already. That's right. By your sins. He sent him in the world so that you can be saved, but to save the world. Amen. Amen. If you're here and you're not saved, the Bible says this. That person who wasn't willing to look, what happened to him? person that said, that's a stupid thing, a serpent on a pole. Are you telling me, preacher, all I got to do is put my faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for me? That's what I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. That's stupid. Okay. It's your choice. I'm not going to make you. I'm not going to try to... Listen, I put the ball in your court, you make up your mind. Yeah. That book says Wages of sin is death. It's death. And anybody who didn't look experienced death. And then it says, but the gift of God is eternal, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Are you going to look and live? Are you going to, listen, are you going to be born again today? Are you going to put your faith in Jesus Christ? Or are you going to continue in your sin? There's consequences associated with it. The best way we know how, we beseech you that you receive not the grace of God in vain, as Paul said. Because he suffered you in a time that's accepted. There's a time period he gives you to get things right. This is the time. This I hope, I hope that it doesn't happen. Somebody could leave this building today and get in your car. And before you get to the light, a catastrophe happens. Listen, you say you're trying to trying to scare me. I am trying to utterly terrify you. If that's what if that's what it takes. You've got no guarantee. None. You can leave here today. It's, it's time to quit playing games at church. And it's time to get your heart right with God and do it his way. Let him make the godly man or woman out of you that he can make. Listen, I don't know how I listen, I don't know how to make it any plainer. Maybe some of you can answer. I don't know what else to tell you. But I know there's some people here that are sitting here that are not saved. I don't know what else to tell you. Will you make that decision today? I hope you will. Please, please take some time to get that thing right. And I want to give you an opportunity. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. Let's sing that song, Look and Live, in the scriptures. If y'all all stand and we'll...